Just before we get started with today's video, I do want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring it. To support Today I Found Out and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash today I found out and sign up for free. While it's likely others tried it before, the first surviving documented attempt of someone trying to turn something into gold in a relatively scientific fashion occurred around 300 AD. The proto-scientist in question was a Greco-Egyptian named Zosimos. During his lifetime, it's thought he wrote nearly 30 books about alchemy, but most of them they have been lost to history. What we do know is that his work focused mainly on the use of vapors, specifically sulfur vapors, which cause some things to turn yellow. For example, he found that when mixed with liquid mercury, the resulting substance became becomes a yellow solid, but it wasn't gold. From there, for 2,000 years, scientists like Isaac Newton, Roger Bacon, Robert Ball, and Yabir ibn Hayyan all tried their hand at making gold. Now all fails, but they did give the world numerous other advancements as a result of their work. As science historian Lawrence Principe noted in 2014, they were amazingly good experimentalists. This all brings us to more modern times and one of the most distinguished scientists of the 20th century that you've probably never heard of, and that's Glenn T. Seaborg. Seaborg was far from being a no-name chemist with a crazy vision of turning lead into gold when he decided to make the attempt in 1980. For example, in 1941, he led the team that first discovered, produced, and isolated the element plutonium. This led to the United States pursuing a program to make plutonium for use in their atomic bomb project, which later morphed into the top-secret Manhattan Project, which Seaborg also worked on. He strongly lobbied for doing a public demonstration of a nuclear explosion to show Japan, rather than actually using the bomb against them. All in all, during his lifetime, he helped discover 10 elements via creating them in a lab, which ultimately saw him receive a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1951. He also discovered or helped isolate well over 100 isotopes, most notably iodine-131, which, if you haven't known someone with certain thyroid diseases, including some types of thyroid cancer, they may well still be alive or have had their life extended thanks to this substance. Along the way, he became the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, advising and working for U.S. Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. During his time in that role, he successfully lobbied for the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, prohibiting the testing of nuclear devices in the atmosphere or under the sea. He also strongly advocated for increased funding for science education in schools, better science curriculum, and increased funding in pure scientific research. He's also the only chemist in history to have an element named after him while he was still living, and that's Seaborgium. All right, so this all brings us to creating gold. In 1980, Seaborg and a group of other scientists used a particle accelerator to propel beams of carbon and neon nuclei at nearly light speed into foils of the heavy metal bismuth. You know, the stuff you find in relatively large quantities in Pepto-Bismol. It's also used for shotgun pellets, as well as a variety of other applications. So why did they use bismuth rather than the originally planned lead? Well, that's simply because it's easier to isolate gold from bismuth than it is from lead. However, producing gold from lead would have been no more difficult. As for the result, when they were rifling through the carnage that was the result of the high-speed collision between neon carbon and bismuth, the physicists discovered that they had successfully made several isotopes of gold. Of course, none of this was economical in the slightest. According to Seaborg, it would cost more than one quadrillion dollars per ounce to produce gold by this experiment. The going rate for gold in 1980 was about $590 an ounce. Still, regardless of cost, finally, after at least a couple of thousand years of effort by some of the finest minds in history, a human had finally created gold from something else. Now, I can't promise you that Brilliant are going to teach you how to turn something into gold, but they can help you learn a whole lot else. You've heard me talk about Brilliant before. They're a learning platform that focuses on active learning. This is where you're given a short bit of information on a scientific concept, and then you're asked to solve a problem based on that information. This is an incredibly effective way to learn. They've got a new feature on their platform called Daily Problems. and It's basically five minutes a day that you can use to exercise your brain and learn something new. A recent one was about how to navigate the universe with solar cells. So, if that sounds fun to you, why not add brilliant daily problems to your daily routine? Maybe do it on your commute, during a coffee break, things like that. Each problem provides you with the context and framework that you need to tackle it. That means that you can learn concepts by applying them. That's active learning. This sort of short daily practice can lead you from curiosity to mastery in far less time than you might think. So just go to brilliant.org forward slash brainfood and finish your day a little smarter. The first 200 of you to do so will get 20% off the annual subscription to view all the problems in the archives. And as always, thank you for watching.